So thanks for joining us in some form or fashion. Our final speaker today uh, is, uh, is also by the name of Teachner, and it's Jamie Teachner. Dr. Jamie Teachner earned his Bachelor of Science in Business from Oakland City University, his MBA from Troy University, and his PhD from Liberty University. He is an award-winning, multi-platinum singer-songwriter, a veteran of the United States Air Force, and he found his place in American military history when he composed Semper Supra, the official anthem for the sixth and newest branch of our armed forces, the United States Space Force. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause for Dr. Jamie Teachner.
was having more success, and I got played on so much regional airplay on the radio in my area that I had the most requested song on one of the stations. And so the next step was Nashville. It was always the next step. So the day before I turned 21 years old, I moved to Nashville. Pat Gala had basically a duffel bag. Duffel bag, well, actually, it was most likely a guitar case or piano case. Uh, but I showed up there and I fell in love with the town. Like I said, it's all I ever wanted to do. And it's all I could ever see myself do. So Nashville, it's called Music City. And so when I was there, I, I just, I ate it up. It wasn't long after that I signed my first publishing deal. And I began seeing success. And I got my first authentic radio hit on country radio. And hearing your song on country radio, it, for, for a boy that grew up wanting that his whole life was, was just life changing. Seven years trajectory where that all of a sudden I got to play that same year, Good Morning America, Grand Ole Opry, and all the things that I thought I always wanted. All of my dreams were coming true. And so at that point, I thought life couldn't get any better. But you see, along with that success, also comes hardships. But we talk about the success. We blast it out on every outlet we can do, whether it be in person or online. But we, we try to hide and diminish and minimize those hardships. For instance, I would talk about my first gold or my first platinum record, but I wouldn't tell you that maybe I had to reschedule the writing appointments because I, couldn't, I didn't have the gas money to get to that writing appointment. Or maybe, maybe I would tell you about how that I was in L.A. or New York or some cool town playing that on tour or on TV, millions of people. But I would tell you that I'm trying to hoard away and save uh, everything I can in order to take a little extra for the home. And so what I, the thing about fame is it does not always equal fortune. And we think it does, especially in and the way it looks, it surely looks like it always does. It. And it does sometimes equal fortune. But we have a saying in Nashville and in the music industry that, you know, we, when we get in the music industry, we have six figure years. And then we have figure out what we're going to do this year. <laughs> <laughs> and so sometimes there's a moment where it just seems like that you're going to coast through and, and get to the next year. And sometimes you're on top of the world. But in 2011, I had two songs on the charts, final charts, and I got a phone call from my publisher in Minston, and I was secretly hoping they were going to say some giant country artist had recorded my song, or that I was going to get to go off and do something really cool. But I called them back, and they said, Jane, so a few things came up. Sony, who was the co-venture for this other company. Uh, a co is when you have a, a deal where there's a major label that's funding the smaller, a uh, major publishing company or label funding the smaller publishing company or label. That's how it that works. So, somebody was not going to pick up the option. Not for me, but for the publishing company. So, by default, who was out of the deal? And it was effective immediately. I, I wasn't getting another check. So, I panicked a little bit on the outside and a whole lot on the inside. And so I didn't know what I was going to do because I, it was my livelihood. It was all I had ever known. I never even dreamed of doing anything but music, playing it for people, performing it, writing it, singing it, all that. And it was my complete identity. I was completely wrapped up in that, that one thing. So I, I took... And there were a couple of things going on at the same time. I want to walk you through this. I recorded my first album and released it. And I took on my first time ever any job outside of playing music for my full-time living. Now, granted, I was still making more money from music than I was from anything else. But I had to try to raise that amount just a little bit. So, 
course, naturally, my life was a marketing message. I was vulnerable in the right room, and I was completely on top of the world, disguising it from the outside. Identity crisis right there is, is all it was in my life, but I didn't realize that. So I, I would go to work. I was, there were times I was an electrician, times I was doing home renovations. There was time, were times that I was building, you know, backyard fences. If anyone needs a fence, just I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that time period, I would go out. I was, I was, like I said, I was doing electrical work and everything, construction work. I went out to my car on my lunch break and I would do phone calls, we call them phoners, with radio stations. And uh, because I had songs that were still out. And I was, you know, I'm talking about, yeah, it's going great, you know, really, it's not going great. But that kind of goes through, and it was 10 months that lasted. And I call that my lost weekend. Lovingly now, it wasn't so lovingly then. But the reason why I call it my lost weekend is because. I read that John Lennon called his 10 months in L.A. his lost weekend. And so I'm sure he probably had more fun and paid more bills than I did while I was in my lost weekend. But either way, I learned a lot from it. And after that, it, the thing is, is when you sign a deal in the music industry, it takes a little bit to actually sign the ink. So even though if I had found a deal immediately, which it didn't take very long, it still took me a while to get that signed because it goes back and forth between attorneys just to explain how that works. So... I go through this lost weekend, 10 months period of time, where I'm working day jobs, playing music a lot, and still you know, trying to write songs and schedule all that. And I signed another publishing deal with a friend of mine, and we began touring. We actually uh, did an independent record deal and released an album, and uh, we began touring, we began all the fun things that come along with that, and we start having success on the charts. It was more independent because it was our own company, but it was it was amazing. And I got to see a lot of the joy come back from what I'd done before in the past. Whenever I was going through that time, I could not shake it because there was something different. I had gone through the lost weekend, and I could never get past that because I was forever changed from that time. So what happened was whenever the, that... Whenever I moved forward with success, I always knew failure was an option, even if it wasn't something I caused, or if it was. And one day, I sat down on our couch, and I was looking through Craigslist for truthfully old vintage guitars, love vintage guitars. Um, if anybody has one of those, you want to get them. I love vintage guitars. So I was looking through that, and I saw an ad that I thought was not legitimate. It was for the United States Air Force. They said, wanted country singer. And I thought, oh, come on. As much as I love the military, and as much of a patriot as I am, I had never heard of such a thing. So I thought it was a joke. And, I, and it was only on there four hours, because it turns out it was against Craigslist rules to advertise in that way, and so they pulled it down. But, by the grace of God, I saw that. And so I called and said, hey, is this legitimate? They said, yes, it is. And then, two months later, I was a basic military trainer in San Antonio, Texas, Lackland Air Force Base. 35 years old, alongside my new peers who were 18 to 20. And uh, that was amazing. We were sleeping in the, in the same bunks. We were showering in the same shower. We were, we were running on the same, uh, in the same formation. We were uh, doing all the same drills. Everything you do in basic military training because just because I was a vocalist didn't mean I had to, I was still having to, having to go to basic military training because I was in the military. So talk about an identity crisis. I'll never forget when they shaved my hair and they issued me the exact same clothes as everyone around me. I'd spent my whole life trying to stand out. And for this moment, the Air Force was doing a successful, wonderful job of making me blend in and making me lose my identity. So I go running in formation. After eight weeks of military training, and I'm missing my family. I hadn't seen them in eight weeks. I talked to them every time I could, but it was very, very few and far between. I'm running, and I, all of a sudden, I, I, I'm running along, and I realized they didn't recognize me because I looked like everyone else. And I, and I recognized them, and I saw them through new eyes. 
and a, a different perspective. It's amazing how much your perspective changes whenever you have a big shift like that. So I ran out of formation, jumped out, ran over and hugged them all. And, uh, you know, my wife and my, my two kiddos, Charlie and Lily. And when I, when I left, it wasn't very long until, I mean, like right after basic training and graduation, which was that day, I had just a few more things to clear up, and then we were off to Colorado Springs, Colorado. And we were out there, loved every second of that. And I, uh, I learned so much about those years. I kept more, I carry more with me than just the haircut. And uh, I, I made some of the closest friends and some of the people I look up to, and I gained so much wisdom. But when I came back to Nashville, uh, remember, I was doing music in, in Colorado Springs, so I didn't realize how much I had, I had actually left the music industry full time. I didn't realize it. Came back, and then it dawned on me when I drove down Music Road, and it was a, it was a ghost town to me, it felt like a breakup. And I realized, I looked through the Bible for answers, because I'm a follower of Christ, and I saw that Abram, who was fatherless, his name was changed to Abraham, and he became the father of many nations. Moses, who was a slave, moved into the home of his oppressor, of his people, and then came back and was a deliverer. David went through several things, but I love the fact that he was a, a songwriter, transitioned to word. <laughs> Rings a bell, something. But then also for Shepherd King. And I can go on and on. I mean, Peter, uh, he was a fisherman, and he became a fisher of men. You know, fishermen are owners. Fishers of men have to be around people. So God changed things, and it dawned on me. And I said, if I had seen my accomplishments as my finish line, as my end goal, I would have missed out on so much value in my life. But the truth is, we can do all the things. We don't have to be tied up in one thing for our identity. We do not have to stick to one thing for the rest of our life. What we do is not who we are. We sometimes tend to, those coexist in many ways. But if we're so tied up in it, we're going to miss it. And I just want to encourage you that God revealed that we are made for more. We are made for more than just one thing for our identity. And I find my identity in Christ. And the truth is, just like that song said that I wrote with Matt Jenkins and Brian Simpson, suitcases. A suitcase can be baggage or carrying, or you can you can set it down and just allow yourself to finally move through life free and with a new perspective. And so we are made for more than just one thing. Thank you very much. Facebook page. Thank you again for coming.